<clears throat> All right, <clears throat> another another fine day and glad to have you with us on our daily devotions. It is April 15th. Yes, it's tax day, April 15th. And today we're looking at First Kings 8 and 9. Um, I suppose it's appropriate it's tax day because we're going to have to ask ourselves uh, who's going to pay for all this stuff Solomon's building. So anyway, uh, the temple has been built and we get in chapter 8 the dedication of the temple. Uh, you got a picture like a huge, huge event, a huge celebration as the temple is finished. And now you have this entourage of bringing the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle, the tent of meeting into the temple. And all of the people who have gathered uh, together to assemble, it's important to remember that the temple, in a sense, is, is it's God's house, but it's also the people's house. It's not Solomon's house. You know, his house is that palace that he spent twice as long building as the temple. But this is for the people. This is where God will be with the people. And even though God cannot be bound by uh, human, humanly built structures, it serves a, a, a present, almost sacramental significant for the people of Israel because significance because it reminds the people that God is with them and that God is there. The temple is the sign of that presence. Um, ah, the dangers of live recording. Yeah, sometimes when you get interrupted. So, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, saying a Hollywood production, folks, we're doing our best. Sorry about the interruption, but now we're back. The beauty of being able to pause your recording. So anyway, back to where we were. So um, you have the temple and and uh, this great celebration. And of course, Solomon gives a, a speech uh, and recounts the history of uh, God being with David and his father and how uh, God told uh David, uh, that he wasn't going to build the temple, and that was left to Solomon. So you get a reminder of the history. Uh, you get a very long prayer of dedication uh, by Solomon. And, and two important notes there the, to, to, uh, that is that first, Solomon it seems like he's asking for forgiveness for Israel's future sins, that if they should ever do this or do that or stray, et cetera, He's asking for uh, uh, forgiveness for future sins. Now, you know, forgiveness in the Bible, forgiveness among the world's religions uh, in Christianity and Judaism is very different from other religions. I want to read to you from the Wesley Study Bible on forgiveness. Forgiveness is at the heart of the Wesleyan order of salvation and no religious book but the Bible teaches that God completely forgives sins. In pardoning sin, God absolves the sinner from the condemnation of the law and removes the guilt of sin, such that those who receive forgiveness are marked by both freedom and peace. Within the church, forgiveness is strongly associated with the celebration of the Lord's Supper as a means of grace. In a world of sin and disrupted relationships, forgiveness is necessary in order to go forward, in order to have hope for the future. The theological term for the forgiveness of those sins that are past, according to John Wesley, is none other than justification. So forgiveness really is at the heart. It's not the be all and end all. It's not the only thing. Uh, and it's actually forgiveness is actually not the end of the Christian faith. The end of the Christian faith is holiness and perfection. But justification, uh, forgiveness is important means in order to get to the end of the Christian faith. So Solomon here is anticipating that Israel is going to need forgiveness. The very fact that the temple is there is an acknowledgement that God's people will need forgiveness. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, Israel uh, or that Solomon asked for or that Solomon wants to uh, ensure is that God will accept this, that the presence of God will be there and God will bless their endeavor in building the temple and their endeavor as a people. So Solomon blesses the assembly and Solomon, we're told at the end of chapter eight, offers all kinds of sacrifices, um, 
the bloody business of sacrifice. And we get a lot of it here, um, but the amount, the number of sacrifices is a way to offer to God for God's blessings uh, in that context. And so Solomon holds a festival. People come from all over. It's a week long festival and everybody leaves happy and uh, in good spirits, we're told, because of the goodness of the Lord that had been shown to his servant David and to his people. Now we get to chapter nine and what we're told is God, uh, when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, uh, the Lord appears to Solomon a second time. Now, this is really interesting. So God obviously approves of this. I mean, we have the we have the account at the temple where the priest can't minister because the cloud envelops the temple. Remember the cloud in the wilderness over the tabernacle that signified God's presence. So this is clearly divine approval that's being revealed. And God ap appears to Solomon and uh, speaks to him clearly approving of what Solomon has done. But I have to note that it's the second time in all of this time that Solomon has been reigning, the years that he's been on the throne. This is only the second time that God has spoken to him. Uh, certainly not what we see with David. Certainly not what we see with Saul either. Saul actually gets more of God talking to him uh, than Solomon does. So it is a reminder that while Solomon at times is seeking to be faithful and God approves of that, Israel overall is heading in the wrong direction. But God appears to Solomon determined to bless him and offer to him the same promise. If you're faithful, I will bless you and your people. If you're not faithful, it ain't gonna be good. Solomon's, all of his accomplishments of building and offering to the people prosperity, none of that will uh, offset Solomon's faithfulness or lack of faithfulness. If Solomon worships God and follows the commandments, it will go well. If the big warning, of course, here is against idolatry. And, and this is huge. And so it doesn't matter what what Solomon has accomplished. It doesn't matter that the stock market is hitting new highs. None of that matters. What, so what God wants of Solomon is faithfulness. And uh, that's central uh, to his leadership over the people of Israel. Um, now, one of the other interesting things that I would like to mention here is uh, that, of course, Solomon uh, offers um, uh, King Hiram of Tyre uh, cities uh, in order to repay him, if you will, for all of what he has, the help he has in, uh, given in building the temple. And uh, he gives him 20 cities in the land of Galilee. And apparently Hi Hiram thinks they're kind of leftovers and he's not real happy with, uh, with it. But uh, we were not told how that's resolved. It's just that I got Solomon gives Hiram these cities and Hiram's just not happy. And, and that's just kind of where it ends up. It could be just a way of, of highlighting the fact that um, Solomon's lavishness, lavishness is really meant mostly for himself. And uh, he's kind of stingy with others. Hard to say for sure, but it could be there for that reason. Now, another thing that's really interesting is if we go back to chapter eight with Solomon's prayer, verse 41, and Solomon's going down the litany of, you know, if we do this or do that wrong, please forgive us kind of a, kind of a uh, chorus that keeps popping up in this prayer. Verse 41, likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays toward this house, then here in heaven, your dwelling place and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you. 
so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, so they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. Okay, so good treatment of the foreigner, right? This is in the law, right? Remember, we've seen this. You will not have two separate laws, one for the foreigner and one for the citizen. They will be treated the same. We've seen this uh, throughout the uh, law of Moses. And so Solomon offers this prayer on behalf of the foreigners in the land. But then notice when we get to verse 15 of chapter 9, this is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon conscripted to build the house of the Lord and his own house. And so we get the, we get the litany. Um, and then we get um, verse 21. All these descendants who were still left in the land whom the Israelites were unable to destroy completely. These Solomon conscripted for slaves labor and so, slave labor, and so they are to this day. It's not ended. But for the Israelites, Solomon made no slaves. They were soldiers, they were his officials, his commanders, his captains, his commanders of his chariotry and cavalry. So we read earlier that he did uh, for some Israelites in the slave labor for his building projects, but he had stopped that. But he still resorted to enslaving uh, non-Israelites, foreigners, which is a direct violation of the law. You will not treat them differently uh, than you treat the citizens. So Solomon um, is, uh, dis is uh, disobeying his own prayer here. Um, and we also have to be reminded in verse 24, but Pharaoh's daughter went up from the city of David to her own house that Solomon had built for her. Then he built the, my, the, the Milo. Um, and so um, remember that Solomon is married to Pharaoh's daughter. Yeah. Well, just a reminder that Solomon is living up to what the Israelites asked for decades before. We want a king like all the other nations. Um, and we also end the chapter with Solomon building a fleet of ships. We don't hear a lot about a navy in ancient Israel. Uh, there, Israel didn't seem to be uh, much into having a navy. Perhaps they really didn't need one. Uh, they did have some coasts there uh, along Gaza when Solomon was king, but they don't really seem to need one. But Solomon builds a whole bunch of uh, uh, ships, and uh, uh, there's just a lot of commercial activity going on. So this is Israel at its height. This is Israel at its economic prosperity, the best that it's ever going to experience under Solomon, and yet we are reminded that economic prosperity is not, is not a, uh, a good cover for failing to keep God's commandments, failing to worship God. God doesn't say, well, Solomon, the economy is good under you, so I'm going to let all this other stuff slip. We don't see that, friends. A closer reading of the text reminds us once again that character matters in leadership. You cannot, you can't throw a rock into the Bible and miss it. So, um, okay, I'm back again. Sometimes, you know, ministry doesn't take a break, folks. So, uh, I'm in a, currently in a situation where I'm recording from the office, but there's a lot of activity going on today. So, uh, and I don't, it's, uh, it, it's a day when I don't have other people to run interference for me, but that's okay. You know, um, we always need to be ready uh, whenever to offer ministry, but I'm back. So let's finish up briefly. So um, again, faithfulness to the covenant and the worship of God is first and foremost central for God, for us. And it's going to be really hard for us to, um, when we have to give an accounting to God, that if we have not been mindful of uh, worshiping him, putting God at the center of our lives and being faithful to God's ways, um, the, the, uh, the resume of our other accomplishments aren't really going to measure up. And that's important to remember. All right, friends, that's where we are for today.
Let's pray. Lord God, again, thank you for the gift of a beautiful day. Thank you for the many blessings you have given to us. And may we in this day and all of our endeavors put you at the center and be mindful of your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Hasta mañana.